Good morning, Interweb. World Builders Log 7. Today, we are going to bore work on the apparent size and brightness of our planetary system. But first, as always, follow up. So main point of follow up today is I want to address the lack of interoperability between the various sheets in this spreadsheet. I've been getting a lot of feedback about this, so just want to make clear what my motivations are. So you'll notice that I ask you to input, say, stellar mass in this sheet. And then I ask you to input again in the planetary system sheet manually, and then again manually in the planet tab, and then again manually in the moon tab. This is a feature, not a bug. This is by design. I'm well aware that I could link everything up simply by clicking on a cell that I want to link, hitting equals, going to where the parameter was first input, and then hit return. And now that's auto updating. But I think that's a bit of a quality of life downgrade, and here's why. In the last video, you'll note that I inputted a semi-major axis for the moon's orbit, which gave me an orbital period for the moon. Then I went over to the calendar tab, I manually input that orbital period here, and had a look at what it gave me in terms of calendars. I didn't like it, so I adjusted it here. I think I adjusted it like five or six times until I found something that was vaguely something I liked. That only is so easy if the sheets are treated like a sandbox. Were they all interconnected, I'd have to compute my semi-major axis for the moon, go to the calendar tab, the orbital period will be automatically updated, check to see if I like the results. If I don't, I have to go back to the moon tab, adjust the semi-major axis, which would auto-update this orbital period, check, don't like it, back to the moon, edit, auto-update, check, don't like it, back to the moon, etc, etc, etc. I just found that it got really cumbersome really fast. There was a stage in a beta version of the spreadsheet where everything was interconnected, but it was such a pain to use. That said, just because I think it's a pain doesn't mean that you will think it's a pain. And this is the beauty of the spreadsheet being a spreadsheet and not say a web app because it's user editable. So if you really don't like having to re-import parameters manually, you can simply wire them all up. Again, click on the cell that you want to connect, hit equals, go to where you want to connect it to, say the original input of the mass here, and then hit return. And then that there is auto updating. Again, though, I consider this a downgrade, a quality of life downgrade. So I'm going to keep it the way it is in the official releases. Final thing is that the reference doc has been updated with information about the home world and the moon. Beautiful artwork here by Van Gogh Van Gogh. Links in the description, go check them out. And if you want to get your hands on the reference doc, head on over to Patreon. Again, links in the description or check out the end screen at the end of the video. All right, and that is follow up done. Let's get building. So today we're going to figure out the apparent size and brightness of our star and the planets relative to one another in our planetary system. But first, let's do some explaining time. As always, input your star's mass here. Spreadsheet then gives you the star's luminosity and radius, but also importantly, it gives you the star's absolute magnitude. When we talk about measuring the brightness of objects in space, we talk about magnitude. So imagine this is our planet and we have these two stars out here, star A and star B, and we want to measure how bright these are. There's two kind of related ways in which you can approach measuring the brightness of objects in space. You can check for the apparent brightness, or sorry, I should say apparent magnitude and or you can check for the absolute magnitude. So all the apparent magnitude asks is from the perspective of the observer, which of the objects are brighter? That's it. So in this case, star A is bright, whereas star B is dim. Now, star A may well be brighter and star B may well be dimmer, or star A could be fainter than star B, but just happens to be closer to the observer, i.e. it appears it's apparently brighter, but it may not intrinsically be so. That's where absolute magnitude comes in. And the way this works is you take the objects you're viewing and you mathematically move them to the same location. So you take star B, for example, here, and you'd move him over to star A. IRL, for stars, you move them all to a distance of 10 parsecs from the observer. And for planets, you move them all to a distance of one AU. But in any case, once they're all at the same distance, then you compare the brightnesses. And now we would find that star A is in fact dimmer than star B, and star B is brighter than star A. So apparent magnitude, how bright does the object appear? Absolute magnitude, how bright actually is the object? To summarize it very roughly. And the scale we use to measure apparent brightness goes a little bit like this. The more negative the number is, the brighter the object appears to be. 
the more positive the number is, the dimmer the object appears to be. Which makes no sense, but I think it's there due to like historical bloat. If an object has a magnitude of about plus five to plus seven, somewhere in that range, that's about at the limit of human vision. Anything greater than plus seven is invisible to the naked human eye. You'd need a telescope to see it. Anything less than plus five, i.e. brighter than plus five, is able to be seen by the naked human eye. And finally, each integer step on the scale is 2.51 times as bright as the previous value. So a plus three magnitude star, for example, is 2.512 times as bright as a plus four magnitude star. And a plus three magnitude star will be 2.512 times as dim as a plus two magnitude star. So this is a log scale. And that's magnitude explained. Negative, bright, positive, dim, apparent magnitude, how bright things appear to be, absolute magnitude, how bright they actually are. So in the case of our sun, its absolute magnitude is about 4.81. Next up, the spreadsheet works out the apparent size and brightness of the star as viewed from each of the worlds in your planetary system. So you input your planets here, you give them their correct semi-major axes, and the spreadsheet tells you the apparent magnitude of the star when viewed from a given world in your system. Again, absolute magnitude, how bright things actually are, apparent magnitude, how bright things appear to be. The more negative the number, the brighter it is. Now that's cool and all, good for a stat sheet, but it kind of doesn't really make any sense. What does negative 28 actually mean? Like, what does it feel like? And that's where the brightness tab comes in. This checks to see the brightness of the star as viewed from the surface of each of your worlds relative to how bright the sun appears to be on Earth. So on Earth, the sun appears to be one times as bright as the sun. On Mercury, the sun appears to be 6.67 times as bright as it does on Earth. And then all the way out of Pluto, the sun is really dim. It's like a distant star. And the final thing this section of the spreadsheet does is check the apparent size of the star. Again, when viewed from Earth, our sun is equal to one here. So on Mercury, the apparent size of the sun is 2.5 times that of the apparent size on Earth. And the further out you go, the more the apparent size drops. All right, pretty straightforward, I think. Next up, we have the planet's apparent brightness and size. How bright do each of the planets appear when viewed from the surface of your home world? First thing you gotta do is put in your albedo. Now note, in the planetary tab, the albedo we used was bond albedo. And in this tab, the albedo we're using is geometric albedo. The two are related yet kind of unrelated. It's really complicated. Bond albedo is used for measurements of temperature, Geometric albedo is used when you're talking about visibility. So in the case of Earth, for example, it has a bond albedo of 0.306 and a geometric albedo of 0.434. Close, but not the same. You think you'd be able to convert really neatly from bond to geometric albedo? You can't. There is a way of converting it. It involves calculus and just it would involve me asking you to give just dozens of esoteric inputs in order to just even remotely get near where you need to be. So for all intents and purposes, the bond albedo and the geometric albedo are basically just unrelated for our purposes. So simply click the little eye icon here and it gives you the geometric albedos of each of the planets in our system. Figure out which of the IRL planets is most like the fictional planet you're working with and give it a similar geometric albedo. That's kind of the only way of working this. It's annoying, but we just need to pick. Then you need to input the radius of your planets and then tell the spreadsheet whether or not the planets have an atmosphere. A tick means yes, it has an atmosphere. Blank means no, it does not have an atmosphere. And we're talking kind of like fairly substantial atmospheres. Like the moon has an atmosphere, but it's really tenuous and it wouldn't count in this case. For example, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they would all count as having atmospheres. Next up, you want to put the input, the distance in AU between the planet and your home world. And the value that you input here has to be somewhere between the minimum and maximum value that the spreadsheet computes. Pro tip here, if you want to input the exact minimum or the exact maximum value, don't input it manually, hit equals, and then select the value you want. Otherwise there'll be some cases where it'll just, it'll go wrong. So you can manually input any value in between these two values, but if you want these exact values, reference those cells. Once the spreadsheet knows how far away the planet you're observing is, it'll do a general check here to see if the planet is a naked eye planet. Is there any point in the orbit of the two bodies where the observed object is visible? 
If the answer is yes, that planet is a naked eye planet and will be known since antiquity on your world. In our system, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are naked eye planets. You do not require a telescope to view them. If it says maybe, your planet is at that human visibility cusp. It's somewhere in this range. It might be visible given the correct conditions, but it also may not be. And if the spreadsheet says no, there is absolutely no way you're able to see these objects without a telescope. And the final portion here is the current tab. And this asks, well, what, what's the current visibility? This is the general visibility, but what's happening right at this very instance? It gives you an apparent magnitude of the object. So at a distance of 1.37 AU from Earth, Mercury has an apparent magnitude of negative 1.39, which is very bright, but it's too close to the star to be visible. Therefore, its brightness is not applicable. Now, that might seem all a bit crazy, and that's where you scan up here to the chart. The little right, I'm gonna have to zoom in here, hold on. Oh boy, <laughs> what's going on? Here we go, oh, 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 there we go. So we have our home world here in red, and we have our star in yellow. And if you notice, Mercury here is this blue dot. It is right behind the sun. There's a little bit of a poking out, but it's too close to be seen. Hence, you can't see it, it has no brightness. Venus at this instant though is negative 4.10, so it is brighter than Mercury. It's visible in twilight, and it's visible with the naked eye, and it's very bright. And again, you can see that on the chart, we have Venus, I'm gonna zoom in again, oh dear. <laughs> there we go, we have our home world, we have our star, and there is Venus, and so on and so forth. Pluto, for example, has a magnitude of plus 15, that's invisible to the human eye. It is invisible at night, but you're going to need a telescope to view it. And you can change all the values here and see what the current setup is. So let's just really quickly do it. I want to choose some random values. And there we go, our little map has updated. Now Mercury, Venus and Mars are visible in twilight only. They're, they're all pretty bright and all the rest are visible at night. Some using a telescope, some visible without a telescope. And then the final thing is the apparent size and brightness of the moon. We've covered this briefly in the previous video, but just to reiterate, input the semi-major axis of your moon's orbit, the radius of your moon, its geometric albedo. So again, look at the list of planets, choose an albedo that's somewhat similar to what you're shooting for. Input the phase your moon is in. Zero degrees is a full moon, 90 degrees is a half moon, 180 degrees is a new moon. And then the spreadsheet tells you its absolute magnitude, how bright the thing actually is and the apparent magnitude of your moon, how bright it appears to be when viewed from the surface of your home world. It gives you then the relative brightness, how bright it is relative to our moon during full moon, the apparent size, how big it is relative to our moon, and then the spreadsheet compares the apparent size of the moon and the apparent size of the star and checks to see whether or not those two would eclipse each other or what sort of eclipses would occur. If the apparent size of the moon is equal to or greater than the apparent size of the star, you're going to get total eclipses on your world. If it's not, you're only going to get annular eclipses. All right, and that is, I think, the sheet explained. Let's get building. So I'm going to drop back in these numbers from my system. So notice again, the absolute magnitude of the sun is 4.81. The absolute magnitude of my star, because it's bigger, more luminous, is more negative. It's brighter. Its absolute magnitude is decreased. Makes sense. Next, I want to drop in the name of my planets and their semi-major axes, so give me two seconds. Alright, so those are my worlds, my rocky planet, my home world, my gas giant, my ice giant, and their relevant semi-major axes. The relative brightness of my star on my home world is 0.78 times as much as the sun, so daylight is a little bit dimmer and the apparent size because we're so far away is 0.66 times that of the apparent size of the sun so the sun will appear smaller and then everything else looks fine there so i'm i'm happy with that let us proceed so this has been all auto populated here for me let's do some clearing up right so we need some geometric albedos here so my rocky planet i'm envisaging it's something like mercury so mercury has a geometric albedo of 0.142 Let's just vary that ever so slightly. There we go. Our gas giant 
again, I'm imagining it's much like Jupiter. Jupiter has, or Jupiter and Saturn are about 0.49 to 0.54. And I think in my reference doc, the image of, yeah, this is quite a white object. I'm just gonna use as an excuse to give it a higher visual albedo. So maybe, yeah, let's do 0.5, let's do 0.55 maybe. And then my ice giant, Again, what does my reference doc art park show? It's kind of a blue color, much like Neptune. So Neptune is 0.42, let's say it's 0.41. Okay, so for radii, again, I'm envisaging my rocky inner world to be somewhat like Mercury. So let's make it, let's make it a smaller version of Mercury. Let's make it point, point 0.3 Earth radii in size. Our gas giant, I've always envisaged him being a bit of a bruiser. So I'm gonna give him a radius of 12 Earth radii. Now, that is the maximum size a gas giant can be. Gas giants tend to be between eight and 12 Earth radii in size, in, in radius. The only time you can go bigger is if you have a hot Jupiter. So you have a gas giant that forms in the outer regions of the solar system. It migrates inward really close into the star and the temperature causes its atmosphere to like puff out and then you can get like what's known as puffy planets or super puffy planets that can have radii greater than 12 earth radii but a standard gas giant like jupiter like saturn out in the outer regions of the system 12 is the absolute maximum and then for our ice giant i'd say somewhere between maybe two earth radii and eight would be kind of a sensible ish range here i'm gonna go with maybe 2.1, actually let's put in some of those decimals to make it look all fancy. And yeah, let's fancy up these decimals a little bit. There we go. So our inner world, slightly smaller than Mercury, our gas giant, chunky, bigger than Jupiter, and our ice giant, I think is smaller than our ice giants. Hold on a second. Neptune is about 3.8-ish Earth radii in size. And Uranus is about 3.94 Earth radii in size. So we kind of have a world here that's like on the cusp, like is it a super Earth? Is it an ice giant? It's kind of a transitional sort of body. I think that's kind of cool. Our little Mercury analog will definitely not have an atmosphere. Our gas giant definitely will have an atmosphere. Our ice giant also definitely will have an atmosphere. All right, let's, put in, let's input some distances here. So just for the sake of it, Actually, I'm gonna do a formula here just for the crack. So a random number, top of the range, minus bottom of the range, plus the bottom of the range, will just give me a random number in between these two ranges. All right, cool. So are all of my planets naked eye planets? Answer, yes. <laughs> So we have no hidden objects. The inhabitants of our home world will know of all of the objects in our system. Which makes sense. We said we went for like a really tight system. So we have no super distance objects. So everything is viewable. All right, in the current situation, let's have a look at our system up here. We have our home world, our star. There's our rocky planet. There's our gas giant. There's our ice giant. Currently, our rocky planet has a magnitude of plus seven. It is too close to star to view. That would make sense. Ergo, its brightness is not applicable. Our gas giant has an apparent magnitude of negative 1.91. It's viewable at night with the naked eye and it's very bright. Again, that makes sense. And our outermost ice giant is 0.533, viewable at night, possibly visible in the naked eye. Because again, it's in that zone where it's, it's at the limit of human vision. So that's kind of cool. I think our outermost planet will probably dip in and out of vision. Uh, which is pretty dope. Let me re-roll some of those numbers just to get a feel for what's going on. Sure, yeah, I'm liking what I'm seeing there. Our outermost planet is just on the cusp. That's kind of cool. All right, and then final, final thing. Let's do some moon stuff. So our semi-major axes, we input this last time, but I reset everything for the sake of demonstration is 477900. Its radius was, what was that? 1.06 moon radii. Its geometric albedo is 1.24. Actually, was that 1.24? Hold on. 
geometric albedo 1.24, perfect. And we'll check it at full moon. Now, notice in the previous video, its brightness was coming out at 1.38 times as bright as our moon. There was a bug in the spreadsheet, or we forgot to square the inverse square law. So what's actually happening with our moon is that its brightness at full moon is 0.48 times as bright as our moon. So darker nights, which makes more intuitive sense and is also really fun. Might be a good excuse to give some nocturnal animals just hella big eyeballs. Parent size is 0.85, so total eclipses are possible. Nothing's changed there. All right, that is what's going on in our planetary system. What is visible, what isn't. Turns out everything's visible and how bright things are relative to one another. And that is basically all of the space stuff done. We're quickly going to get into mapping and climate zones and things like that. Next video though, I'd like to do a sort of polishing up episode. Just go back over some of the old spreadsheets and just tighten things up. There's a couple of things I want to tweak and change, but because everything's been explained, it'll be a really quick sort of speed run episode. And that is basically it. Thank you so much for watching folks. I really hope you enjoyed. Final massive shout out to Vanga Van Gogh, resident artist extraordinaire. Go check them out too. Links to everything you need to know in the description. Until next time, Ed Grouse.